Okay, so do you see my GitHub page here that I'm? Yeah, looks good. Okay, so uh, yeah, so my talk is in this uh, in this uh, talk in my talks repo here. Pangea showcase on the date. There's an abstract. There's the slides here, which is all just a markdown document. So we're gonna document of a markdown. So this is a talk about uh, the lessons that I've learned along with Ryan uh, teaching uh, Pangeo um, in the classroom at uh, Columbia University in our Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Categories for today's talk are uh, the Jupiter book, which we'll go through and we'll talk a little bit about what's in there and how we flow the course over uh, a semester um, going for um, basically with students from zero to X-ray on Pangeo over the course of the semester. Talk a lot about uh, pedagogical mechanics, and this is an exciting part of the talk, I think, because we've come to a place where we have something that's pretty successful regarding, you know, the actual process of getting these um, pretty difficult topics um, taught. <clears throat> I'll talk about the value of Pangeo, which is highly valuable, and uh, I'll mention the great Conda debacle of 2022, which is really fun. Uh, the next is sort of a conundrum about data, you know, is it, you know, can we make, uh, can we use real data from real data providers or, or is it better to, to not do that? And we'll talk, dig in deep into that. Um, I'll talk about the assignments that we provide to the students and our grading or rubrics. Um, and I'll talk about the final projects, which the students do, which are really cool. Um, and then, uh, I'll finish up talking about what we're, um, kind of planning next. Um, including an advanced course and hopefully some more community engagement. Right. Okay. All right. So, um, so the book. So the book is written uh, primarily by Ryan, with lots of input from me and a few other people, including Carrie Key. Uh, and we've been using this online Jupiter book to teach this um, earth science class at Columbia University. Ryan and I alternating over the last four. Four or five years, Ryan teaching it, I think a little bit longer, six, seven years, I'm not entirely exactly sure, but quite a long time. We teach this class to first year graduate students mostly, or it's aimed at least toward them. Undergraduates are allowed to take it with our permission, and sometimes students come from other other departments like engineering and, and even uh, like our uh, health, uh, uh, our, our health uh, school mailman school of public health i think is what it's called we've had some from some students from there as well um and other places around the university but it's primarily um for our first year graduate students in um in D's department of earth and environmental sciences um and like i said it's taking these students from in many cases almost no programming experience um no experience with um unix with git GitHub, um, and even maybe any programming experience, uh, all the way to some pretty powerful X-ray stuff over the course of about uh, five months, and um, and it seems to work um, pretty well. So let's pop over to the book here. There's a link in my talk to uh, the book contents itself. The book is a Jupiter book. It's online, um, and. Uh, what the book has uh, is a series of chapters um, that basically takes the students from learning the basics of Jupyter Lab and, and, and Unix and Git um, through X-Array. We don't quite follow, or at least I don't quite follow uh, the, the flow of the book as it's written because there's some components of the book that uh, here in the, in the first part that are associated with managing Python environments and binder and reproducible research and other ways of of reproducing uh our our work we kind of uh do a couple of lectures on uh of the jupyter lab interface unix and git for version control um and then we pop on to python fundamentals and if you look at python fundamentals you'll see that the very first coding line in python fundamentals is a equals one okay so that's where we start right it's almost, I can't think of anything more basic than A equals one. And some of the students have never seen that before. Um, and so then we move on through uh, a little bit more um, complex Python functions. We talk a little bit about classes. Um, I kind of skip classes usually. 
um, for this group. Um, and then uh, we do NumPy, Matplotlib, um, Pandas, a couple of lectures on Pandas, a couple of lectures on X-Array, mapping, and then a few other kind of more advanced lectures near the end. And so that is how this, the course is sort of structured. We have, um, we tend to have uh, one lecture per week. So the class is taught two days, Tuesdays and Thursdays for about an hour and a half per class. And I will uh, teach a lecture on Tuesdays. And then on Thursdays, we'll have a collaborative time where the students are allowed to uh, mingle with each other, work together in groups, small groups or large, however they want to organize themselves on the homework assignments um, that we assign. And I'll get a little, and I'll get into the homework assignments a little bit later. So I don't know if you can see this because this is our coursework system. This is like, I think this is, don't know how to make this um, public, but you know, we have basically, you know, we do this sort of like lecture, collaborative time, lecture, collaborative time thing throughout the whole uh, semester. So onto the pedagogical mechanics. So like I said, we're teaching first year earth science graduate students, but most of them are just su super sharp. They're, they're really great to work with or a joy to work with, um, but they really uh, in some cases have minimal experience. And what we found as uh, to be kind of the key to this to the sort of kingdom here is to code from scratch and that means uh coding uh from starting from a blank notebook and asking the students to follow along and code along with us so we get into a, a pangeo system which we'll talk about in a little bit here everybody will be on the same pangeo system everybody starts off with a blank notebook including me um and i start coding uh, kind of slowly and you'll see how slowly really actually things are and I look back at it and I thought wow this is really slow but um I'll talk more about that in a second here I use this two monitor Ryan does this too this two monitor system or two computer system I bring two laptops to class it helps you know with your sort of nerd um, cred to, to have two computers um, one of them hosts the uh, blank notebook and the other one would host the uh the complete lecture that, that the kind of use for reference and and walk through the lecture that's already been completed but they don't see that one they just see the blank notebook okay and like i said it goes pretty slow and i wanted to show an example of just how slow and so here is um a bit of of video uh because i've recorded all of my lectures this year um even though we were in person um, in for the last two or three years, we've been um, not in person because of COVID, but this year we were totally in person, but I re recorded the class sessions anyways, in case somebody might miss a class or uh, I don't know, maybe for posterity or this, this particular instance here. So I'll just kind of like show you a few about a minute maybe of me talking slowly uh, about um, X-ray interpolation. All right, so let's talk about interpolation. Interpolation is awesome. It's another thing that um, can be a big pain without um, without the X-ray dimension and coordinate handling power. So let's make a new data set. So X data is our X coordinates. Let's say MP dot array. Data, data array, x underscore data uh, squared. Uh, we'll call those are I'm actually typing everything out here, building an x array from scratch. Data values, got coordinates, and With if we plot it, x plot dot it cell, to the location, where I have but we area. can uh, use value, which is 20 point. 4.5 with a method get to that oh there's an error this is great i make a, i make a mistake and that gives us a value of 16 which is some in our original data result so all the people on this call are probably like um super super coders and that probably looks really slow um 
and but you saw there are a couple of really cool things. One is that you know we made the, that that X ray from scratch. Sometimes we do that, or at least we do that early on, and that's really helpful because it sort of helps students understand uh, these data structures uh, at, from their at their core, you know, and the most basic elements of them, including, for example, in this case, just some some data and maybe some um, um, dimension names and some coordinates. Uh, and then also you saw that I made some mistakes. I actually coded some mistakes. I kind of a little lot of time talk, you know, talk intently about uh, these these stack traces, which which people get overwhelmed by. And I'll, I'll dig into them and, and talk about what the stack traces mean and where in the stack trace things are that are important. But the other thing that you'll notice is that I'm going very slow. Um, from our, you know, from our, from my own kind of anecdotal experience and from you know asking students or polling students what we find is that this speed is really probably a little too fast for about half of the students and it's a little too slow for about the other half so in my opinion that's that's um that's just right and even though you know this feels slow to me and to maybe to you and to you know anyone who's teaching this it doesn't feel so slow to the students you know we've all been in um, talks where you know a, a speaker zoomed through or clicked through you know cells in a notebook way too fast for you to figure out what the code is or maybe you've done it yourself and you found that you lose your your audience or maybe you don't really need them to understand it but with the students you really need them to understand it and so going slow having them code along with you is kind of in in my opinion and i think i can speak for ryan as well here um pretty critical to to making this work and to getting them um moved along and you'll see that even though this is pretty slow and we're we're starting really uh from a very simple place you, you know even here at x in the x-ray second uh second uh lecture you'll see by the end of this talk that the students actually get to some really really advanced places in a pretty short period of time okay so do we want to have could I give some a time for some questions or do we not want to do that right now? I think keep going and then we'll discuss at the end. Okay. So uh, I won't talk too much about this because all you all are uh, Pangeo. Uh, you, you've already uh, had, you know, drank the Kool-Aid on Pangeo. It's an awesome environment and we've been using it for so long. I think it's important to kind of just step back and remind everyone that like, it's easy to take these platforms for granted. I mean, when, when when everybody logs into the same system with the same kernel and all the same uh, versions of all of the same uh, packages, it makes things so much better and easier. Uh, and um, and we've been doing it for so long, it's sort of, I kind of actually forgot how hard or how difficult it can be when you don't do that. And um, so during one of the classes this year, when I taught this in the fall, I decided that I was going to help everyone install Miniconda on their computers so that they could learn on their own computers about how to uh, like build an environment and install some packages inside of that environment and use, you know, environment files to share their environments. And uh, I think calling it the great Miniconda kind of debacle of 22 is a little bit overstating the situation for fun, but I mean, it's unbelievable, like how, you know, just installing Miniconda on a bunch of computers, half of which are Windows machines, or maybe a, a, some brand new version of, of, of Mac OS just doesn't work. And, you know, I <laughs> ended up running around, you know, dealing with all of these um, errors in the, in the installation. And that was just for installing, you know, Miniconda in one environment. And so sort of, reminded myself in this process like of how helpful it is and how good Pangeo systems are and after we sort of did that and not didn't really uh, I say we didn't really succeed so much uh, I went back to basically teaching them um, Conda on the, the Pangeo system inside of the Pangeo terminal so Pangeo uh, gets a yes and a big plus up for for that. So uh, another really interesting question that we've had, and, and I don't know if we've actually quite entirely solved this problem yet, but 
um, is how to deal with um, data that um, may or may not come from, you know, real data providers. So in this class, you know, we do start from a very uh, fundamental level, but we get into uh, importing data uh, from uh, from data providers and In some cases, we've decided to move some data from data providers into um, like our HTML, like homepages space um, at Lamont. And in some cases, we're still able to have the students get data directly from a data provider, such as uh, such as Noah, and I'll show you uh, an example of that here. Uh, oh yeah, I was gonna show this. Uh, so yeah, in one of our uh, lectures, this is an assignment uh, to analyze some Argo float data, um, we ask them to download these data using Pooch from Ryan's RPA uh, uh, web page uh, directory. And these are real data that come from Argo, but they are not data coming from a data provider and they don't change uh, from year to year. They don't get weirder or uh you know have things uh, like regarding their uh, format or the names of columns or something change because it's basically static 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 sitting as a zip file on our uh, Lamont server and that obviously works really well um but we can um you know predict everything that's going to happen for them and they don't really have to work too hard to clean these data up because we sort of know how to do it. Um, another case would be these uh, this pandas assignment where we ask them to go and get hurricane data from NOAA. So NOAA still offers some hurricane data uh, on this site here in cia.noaa.gov. We ask them to go get some data, which comes as like CSV file, I think. And then we have them read the data as, with uh, pandas. And uh, that has worked. It worked last year, the year before, maybe the year before that. Sometimes this doesn't uh, work though. Sometimes what will happen is that these sites will move or they'll shut down entirely or they'll require some kind of a login or some kind of account. Um, and that happened, you know, with like a lot of the, um, the NASA data ended up getting into that kind of a problem. And so, you know, real data is becoming harder to use, you know, because account requirements are becoming co more common mainly. And this trend is like just completely opposite of what Ryan and I have been advocating for many, many years, which is to make data easier and easier to get and less fortressized. Um, but I don't know. It's not, we're not, I don't think, I don't think personally, I don't know how well I'm succeeding. In this class, you know, real data is a bit more of a problem, I think, for the instructors than the students. Because, you know, basically in the case of these uh, assignments, you know, if the, you know, I'll do the assignment before I set, send it to the students. And if this assignment data doesn't work anymore, I have to spend, a, you know, half a day figuring out how to get the data from somewhere else or to clean it up in some ways. So real data is great, but I don't, not convinced yet that it's actually very helpful for the student because it kind of, we kind of have to make it work for them on our own. And I think this is a great point for discussion when we get to it later. Um, so assignments. So our assignments, in my opinion, are actually quite difficult. Um, we assign one a week, basically. So you know, we do like two pan, we do two pandas lectures and two pandas uh, assignments for each lecture, and then we do two X-ray uh, lectures and two X-ray assignments for each of those two lectures. And let's see, yeah, here's an example of one with uh, X-ray. Uh, for our, our second X-ray lecture, we asked the students to download some data, some uh, sea surface temperature data from NOAA. And here again, we're actually using real data. This is coming from, or from a, a real data provider uh, here from NOAA. And we asked them to, you know, recreate this graph. This is the SST anomaly, um, you know, in the El Nino 3-4 region. It requires them to, you know, uh, figure out how to, uh, window the data in space and calculate, um, you know, this this um, index, you know, that is requires 
group by and, and, and rolling operations is actually quite, quite, um, quite hardcore in my opinion, but the students do fine with it. And I mean, they do really well. Um, it, it kind of amazes me that they do so well. Um, you know, we kind of go slow in class and then we give them this really hard assignment and they nail it. You know, they just, they almost all the time. We have uh, a set of rubrics that we have um, for each of the assignments. They're really quite detailed. Um, here's one here, um, you know, showing that basically we kind of split each homework assignment that's worth 100 points up into an equal amount of points and they get, um, you know, full credit for it being complete, correct, and demonstrating effective use of the concepts. And then they sort of get docked points for, for either not using constant you know, not using the concepts that we discussed in class or, or not completing them or not completing them at all. Um, and here again, you know, like I said, the students just do uh, really well. I, I, I tell the students that there are graduate students, they can, um, they're capable of A-level work and, the, and I expect them to turn in A-level work and they turn in A-level work, um, you know. But I also think we have, I mean, we have a, a pretty, we have awesome graduate students. I don't, I, at the risk of embarrassing them, I think they're they're pretty awesome. Oh, uh, the rubrics are pretty detailed and they're great, but they haven't been made public. They're still sitting on the coursework server. Uh, and I think this is something that we should probably think about doing for other people who 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 want to teach this class out of this book is to is to publish the rubrics. Uh, okay, so every semester we do final projects. They're a total highlight of the course. Um, they're super fun. Students develop their own projects that are based on um, the scientific interests that they have, and they do that in concert with uh, me or Ryan, and they do it also sometimes in concert with their labs or their uh, advisors who want them to work on something. Um, and we have this um, final project requirements page where we talk about the learning goals. Uh, and the data set requirements, basically the students are required to download a data set of some varietal from a, a real data set, preferably public. And I, I usually stick to that almost exclusively, although some I have made exceptions in the past. Um, to use pandas or x-ray and a lot of the kind of the, the skills that we've learned over the course of the semester to clean up the data, plot the data, make pretty plots, make some calculations, you know, have a... Uh, a kind of question, a scientific question or a hypothesis to explore, explore the question and, and come up with some kind of uh, some kind of a, a conclusion that, you know, sometimes in some cases, you know, turns out to be publication level work and sometimes uh, not, but always really pretty good. Here's an example of one of the most of them. All of them are public on GitHub. The, the final projects are public on GitHub, although I noticed uh, in preparing for this talk that some of them had removed had removed uh, the repos from their uh, from their githubs and I don't know why this is Carolyn's who's looking at um, um, who's looking at um, um, wildfires across the the west and you know she imports all these data and clean it, cleans it up and makes some cool plots showing differences uh, over the course of, of the year does a bunch of pretty fancy uh, you know, X-ray uh, uh, and group by enrolling operations to, to get these kind of trends for how um, wildfires uh, in the Western United States have changed over the last 20, 30 years. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. Pretty, um, most of the students just do unbelievable work and, uh, and with really advanced levels of, of computing knowledge starting from zero it's it's honestly um, quite cool very advanced considering our starting point so basically uh you know the next steps for this work are i think in my opinion to develop a next course the students uh you know start from uh start from a very beginner level and get to a pretty advanced level with pandas and x-ray by the end of the semester and they're sort of like just at that point ready to do some really awesome data science um and uh but the semester ends and so we have to stop and so i've been kind of working with rich and ryan to uh, think about ways to 
and uh, build a new advanced textbook that includes things like, um, you know, a little more advanced Git, which is kind of my favorite thing, um, more advanced X-ray, getting into geopanda shape files, um, doing more work with Dask. You know, we kind of touch on a little bit in our class, but not much. Um, you know, signal processing, I think would be really good. All kinds of, you know, the more advanced reading, writing, and searching for data that, that we have now, including things like XPublish, um, stack catalogs, uh, and Kurt Chunk. Oh yeah, there we go. That should be in there. Uh, more, more stuff with cloud um, and, and, and learning more about cloud. I thought that maybe Kubernetes is a bad idea. It probably is. Um, and then visualization using um, HVplot instead of Matplotlib. We usually we mostly work with Matplotlib through this course, but we um, I get into HVplot with one in one class, and I think we could probably switch entirely over to that at the advanced level and some more science e stuff. So yeah, um, and also more community engagement. You know, I'm sure you're all aware of the of the. Um, Project Pythia project and you know software carpentry and other things and I think that they've done a great job of building uh, communities and I think that um, you know I think what we've done here is 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 built out the pedagogical mechanics in a way that I think is really good and so somehow like joining together or maybe finding a way to to increase community engagement um, on this project um, would be valuable and and um, using some of those other projects as a as a guide. All right. So uh, it's 1.30. Probably talk too long. I'll stop here and ask you if you have any feelings that you would like to discuss. Hey, thanks very much, Tim. Um, Ryan, you can stop the recording. And um, yeah, let's um, go to some questions or thoughts. I see Kevin, you have your hand up. I know you've been teaching a class also. Uh, yeah. So uh, thanks so much, Tim, for sharing. Um, uh, like you, I, I've taught uh, a couple of classes kind of teaching the Pangeo ecosystem and, you know, you're